Nicole Auerbach from The Athletic was the first to report this story. She joins us now. Nicole, to the best of your knowledge in reporting this story, what was the process of the Big Ten getting to this point? Well, I think that these were conversations that have been happening um, over the last week. I mean, I think everyone in college athletics understands that in the last two weeks, everything has shifted as there have been outbreaks in so many college football hotbeds. There have been the need to shut down voluntary workouts on a number of campuses, including Ohio State. And so these are conversations that have been happening within the Big Ten and the Pac-12 um, for some time. And honestly, this is something that people have wondered about very, you know, since the beginning of the pandemic, whether or not leagues would just go to conference only. And I will say over the last month, a lot of um, Power Five athletic directors, some in this league and some elsewhere, have brought up the fact that, you know, it, it, the testing disparities across the board were going to be challenging for college football because you don't want to put your athletes mixing with the population that is doing different things from a testing and safety and protocol standpoint. So that was definitely part of it. And then obviously there have been restrictions on travel. You've seen a number of states implement those 14-day quarantine periods when you come back from traveling to an at-risk state. So there are a lot of factors there that go into non-conference scheduling in a normal year. And this year, I think, you know, when you see in these statements, you see the emphasis on the flexibility of being able to move and kind of taking out some of those variables of those non-conference opponents. That was something that was attractive to, to, to athletic directors in this league. Nicole, what's your sense in terms of the number of games? Were you able to kind of unearth any of that? The Big Ten typically plays nine conference games would we expect potentially more? Yeah, I think the expectation is that it would be 10. Um, and, you know, I, again, it's, it's kind of a round number. Um, again, when you have less than what was previously scheduled, which is, you know, a 12-game regular season, it does potentially allow for some flexibility to push back a little bit. And again, when you have less variables and less, less outside schools, that flexibility is a lot easier because right now we saw with the Ivy League and what we saw with the ACC earlier today with their fall sports that aren't football is everyone's trying to buy themselves a little bit of time, right? To get more of a grasp, to let these outbreaks diminish, you know, to, to get things under control, to see how football practices are going to work and what the impact might be on positive test results as more and more team activities are allowed, right? So if you go to less than a 12-game season, you do have some flexibility in that sense um, because you could possibly push back your final decisions about a fall season if it comes to that. Nicole, it's interesting. Obviously, we're the Big Ten Network. We focus on what goes on in the Big Ten. That, that's that's what we do. Those are our marching orders here, and, and that's what we're primarily concerned with. But non-conference scheduling has such a profound impact throughout college football. I mean, there really is a domino effect here. You think about a league like the MAC. There are 11 games scheduled between the MAC and the Big Ten with nine different schools being impacted. So a couple had multiple games, 36 schools in all had games scheduled against the Big Ten. Now they know they will not have those games. What are the broader impacts throughout college football of decisions like the one that the Big Ten made today and like other leagues are considering? Yeah, and it, it's huge. And from, from an FCS standpoint and Group of Five standpoint, there are a lot of programs that rely on the money that they get from games like this, buy games, guarantee games, as we call them, um, to really prop up their entire athletic departments. And so I think you are going to see mixed reactions from from athletic directors and officials in those leagues who, you know, are, are probably a little bit glad there will be some people who are glad there's some clarity, right, and, and, and the ability to move forward now. And then you also have people who are very upset about not having these games and that the Big Ten is protecting itself and not helping these athletic departments really exist and sponsor other sports. And so I think that it's very possible that we will see ripple effects from decisions like this. And, you know, sources tell me that the Pac-12 has also been discussing a similar conference only model, that the ripple effects are for those FCS opponents, the leagues that they're in, if they don't have buy games, is it worth trying to put on a football season in the fall? And you could see those same questions come to some of the group of five members as well, because again, these game contracts, the money that they are normally worth, what they are what they are getting to come and play a game like at the big house or the shoe, those are those that's real money to these athletic departments that props up their ability to offer other sports. So there are definitely ramifications for all of this. I, I don't think the Big Ten is going to be the only conference to do this. So this is just going to continue to impact more and more conferences and individual schools throughout college football. 
Nicole Auerbach from The Athletic. Great work breaking this story today, Nicole, and thanks so much for taking a few minutes to join us. Absolutely. Anytime.